like to invite in turn up to the dais all the participants in this afternoon's session. So if I could invite first of all the chair of proceedings, Mr. Nitin Desai, who's a former Under Secretary General of the UN and a distinguished fellow of Terry, Mr. Desai. And then our keynote speaker this afternoon is Ms. Monique Babu, who is Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. Monique. And then they'll be joined by our distinguished panelists. If, my, my inv if I may invite, first of all, uh, the Honorable Patricia Appiah-Jay, who is the Deputy Minister for Environment, Science, Technology, and Innovation of the Government of Ghana. And then His Excellency Ayaz Saeed Kayoum. He's Attorney General and Minister for the Economy, Public Enterprises, Civil Service, and Communications, in the Government of the Republic of Fiji. Welcome. And I'd invite Mr. Chancho Nobu, who's Secretary of the National Environment Commission of Bhutan. And last but absolutely not least, Dr. Sanjasyaren Oyun, who's chair of the Global Water Partnership. And I'll invite Mr. Desai, if you will, sir, to commence proceedings. Thank you. Well, first, let me welcome all our panelists to this session. <clears throat> it's the first time the Convention on Desertification has been present at this event, and I particularly welcome it because the convention is one of the products of the Rio conference, of which I was, of course, a deputy secretary general. It's a convention which I was present at at the birth and its subsequent nurture. Uh, I just wanted to mention before we start a friend, the first executive secretary of the convention, Hama Arba Diallo. Hama Arba Diallo worked with me in preparing for the Rio conference. He's one of the three directors in the secretariat and later to co as the first executive secretary of the Convention on Desertification and nurtured it to maturity. Uh, I just wanted to mention it because Hamar Badiallo is uh, no more with us and I just felt that it would be nice if I could be permitted to dedicate this session to the memory of Hamar Badiallo who did a great deal of work in the UN for the issues that we'll be talking about today. I won't take any more of your time we have an excellent panel, and it's important that we listen to it. But let me begin first by requesting Monique Barbu, the Executive Secretary of the UN Convention on Desertification, which has recently done a magnificent report on uh, a global land report. Monique Barbu. Thank you, Mr. Desai. Good afternoon to all of you. It's uh, very always inspiring to be in that part of the world and like I like to do it, I would start uh, with something from the Vedas, which has been written more than 3,500 years ago, and which uh, reads as follow. Upon this handful of soil, our survival depends. Steward it, and it will grow our food, our fuel, and our shelter and surround us with beauty. Abuse it, and the soil will collapse and die, taking humanity with it. So India is really indeed blessed with a wise and ancient civilization. Yet, tragically in India, as in much of the rest of the world, we have embarked on a headlong, almost suicidal, dash for modernity. We have acquired material wealth, but modernity and wealth has given us an inflated idea of our own intelligence. We have forgotten not just ancient wisdom and traditional knowledge, but basic the, things sorry. such as where our food, fuel, and shelter come from. As Tagore eloquently put it, emancipation from the bondage of the soil is no freedom for the tree. I would suggest no freedom for mankind either. 
We have abused the soil to such an extent that every year, 24 billion tons collapse and die. And each year, we lose 12 million hectares of land from production. That increasingly put our future wealth and even survival on the line. With that in mind, of course, it is a great honor to be here in Delhi. And I would like to also express my appreciation to Terry for the marvelous organization of this year's summit and thank the government of India for being a champion of the global climate biodiversity and land agenda. After the inspiring word of Prime Minister Modi this morning, I think that there should be some hope. And after yesterday's session, I am sure that you, were, you are aware that India has committed to achieve land degradation neutrality by 2030. Why is that important? Well, if you think about the scale of the transformation mankind has imposed on the land over the last couple of centuries, it is alarming. In addition to industrial scale agriculture, we have deforested, stripped mine, and paved the soil for urban expansion. Land degradation neutrality is about stopping that loss and achieving a measure of balance. You can think about it like a set of scales. On the one side, demand is increasing. We will reach 10 billion people in less than 30 years. This is an extra 76 million mouths to feed each year. Already, with just over 7 billion people on Earth, 800 million people go to bed hungry every day. To meet demand in the next few decades, we will need to produce 70% more food globally. Demand for water and energy will also rise dramatically. On the other side of the scale, the supply of resources is tightening. The pressure of climate change and water scarcity are already being felt, and this will intens intensify. With less land and less water, competition for access to productive resources will gather pace. That is already happening at the local level. For example, in Africa, in and around Lake Chad, where the resilience of the ecosystems and people is very near collapse. But there are other regions which are being destabilized, and countries may well come to blow. It is a future geopolitical challenge that the international community needs to take more seriously. India, I fear, will not be immune from either the local or geopolitical challenge. India, for example, will be the world's most populous country, reaching 1.7 billion people by 2050. Up to two-thirds of Indians derive their livelihood from climate-sensitive sectors such as farming, fishery, and forestry. And the recent atlas produced by the Indian Space Research Organization indicates that 30% of the total land of India is degraded. Indians already migrate from rural to urban areas in large numbers, seeking a better life in the cities. By 2025, more than 40% of the population is likely to be urban. They are not just attracted to the bright lights, though they are abandoning the land because of falling productivity, extreme climatic conditions, tenure insecurity, or debt. So the scales are heavily tipped and not in our favor. 
how will we balance them? By avoiding the degradation of new land while restoring the land we have already degraded. We can stabilize the stock of healthy and productive land and then grow it. Done right, the potential is huge. There are 2 billion hectares of degraded land in total on the world. Around 500 million hectares of that was once fertile is now degraded and considered abundant agricultural land. So achieving land degradation neutrality makes sense at every level because healthy lands contains more carbon and stores more water, achieving LDN means we can help adapt to climate change. We could, by that, reduce the impact of drought, flood, and other climate-related shocks. At the same time, it will help sequester hundreds of millions of tons of carbon every year fighting climate change at all. Bef because also healthy land is more productive, achieving LDN means we can improve nutrition and food security for the rural poor by closing 90% of the agricultural gap. Expand rural employment for a growing population and accelerate business opportunities. So how can we do it? It needs good policy and political engagement, of course. Globally, that means the recognition of environmental factors as key drivers of insecurity at the level of the UN Security Council and of migration during the negotiation of the Global Compact. The full achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, where land rehabilitation is a cost-effective investment and an accelerator of sustainable development. And finally, the full implementation of the Paris Agreement, especially in terms of securing more funding for adaptation where the land use sector is a critical resource. At national level, it means rolling out approaches that give people ownership and long-term security over the land they work, offer financial and other fiscal incentive for activities that protect and regenerate the land rather than those that degrade it. It means also to design policies and business models that can unlock private sector investment. And finally, stress a responsibility for long-term thinking, planning, and even investment in smart land use and management on public and private decision makers. So the seeds in the form of ambition and the framework for a transformation to land degradation neutrality are there we now need to turn ambition into delivery. There are millions of hectares with the potential for rehabilitation across the world. There are external resources from public and private sector available to help with the transformation. It can be GEF, the Green Climate Fund, and also new financing tool like the one we just helped create the LDN Fund. The LDN Fund is actually a very innovative public-private partnership. We first raise capital coming from public sector. It channels private investment towards land rehabilitation. But India can also mobilize a huge pool of internal financial and human resources. My call to Indian enterprise is to think about the role of land in their value chain strategy. If you want to include the 70% of Indian who live <clears throat> in rural area, 
in a resilient and increasingly vibrant economy, you have to start from the ground up. So Indian people can make a real change. And let's encourage them to first seek opportunity in adversity. So the glass is not half empty, it's, it is half full. Land degradation and drought are a growing challenge in this country. But the rehabilitation of India degraded land will offer opportunity from the smallholder to the state government. Let's grasp it. Do more with less. LDN lets you reduce cost, but also add value. The shift to sustainable land management will mean fewer inputs in terms of seeds, fertilizers, and water, but it won't lower quality or yields. Let's create more opportunity despite climate pressure. Think and act flexibly. We can reimagine value chain for rural worker. In Africa, communities are achieving LDN by exporting superfoods like moringa to Europe. Let's reimagine Asian value chain. Keep it simple. The most costly over engineer way to rehabilitate the land are not always needed. Simple techniques often drawn from that almost forgotten traditional knowledge and wisdom tends to work best. Let's put simple skills and knowledge into the hands of rural people. They will do the rest. Include the margin. In the West, companies often look at marginal segments of society as risky and non-profitable. 70% of Indians live in rural area. Let's include them in our vision for India. Finally, follow your heart. This is your motherland. You have to reconnect with it. And as Mahatma Gandhi said a long time ago, action express priorities. So I will urge all of us to act. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, for that clarion call for addressing the key issues of land degradation and the goal of stopping all degradation by 2030. I'm happy my country has signed on to that goal. I hope all the others do so also. Uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, Patricia Apegyai. She is a Deputy Minister for Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation in the Government of Ghana. Thank you very much. First of all, I must uh, show my appreciation for in making me part of this panel and to tell our side of the story so far as the uh, achievement of the land degradation neutrality is concerned. Um, Mr. Chairman, if you of the about land degradation uh, land degradation is now increasing, being recognized as a key developmental issue in Ghana. That requires a very decisive and sustained action, backed by a resolute political will. And I must assure you that my government, that my president, is very committed to ensure that we, as a country, have done our best to do that. We live in a country where almost 50% of our land is degraded. It's degraded through uh, the illegal mining, through uh, forest uh, degradation by pulling down trees for wood, for furniture, for other usage. Our uh, land is also notably endowed with several national parks and reserves. But currently, uh, people have started entering those lands and uh, degrading them. Ghana lands generate much of our country's income. 
and the employment and livelihoods of a large majority of the population depend on the land resources. However, it is highly vulnerable to degradation and land productivity, soil fertility, water bodies, vegetable cover, natural habitats and biodiversities are being lost as part of the broader process of our land degradation. High among these ones, we know for a fact that deforestation forms about 2.9%, 135,000 hectares of uh, our forests are now degraded. Ghana's forest cover has almost halved. We uh, say we have 4.6 million hectares remain in 20, by the 2011 statistics with 1.6 hectares as forest reserves. Current agricultural practices have led to the declining soil quality, deforestation, accelerated erosion, siltation of water bodies, reduced crop yields, increasing desertification condition. Apart from the farming, from the farming, the demand for the fuel wood and other wood products has led to degradation of woodland and forest over extensive areas. This is mainly through harvesting of poles for building purposes, fuel wood, charcoal production, bush fires, road construction, mining, sand, and gravel. We have lost, fight of the, uh, lost sight of the fact that we need our land to survive. So surface gold mining as an alternative to uh, any employment or uh, any high yielding uh, venture has been the order of the day and is currently taking place in all the landscapes. I'm talking about, we have 10 regions and I'm talking about all the 10 regions being degraded. A consequence of these activities are total destruction of vegetation in the landscape, total destruction the impoverished subsoil, not ideal for agriculture, is exposed. There is occurrence of erosion along the upslopes, leading to gully formation, stagnation of water in depression, breeding of mosquitoes, leading to health hazards, pollution of water bodies, and hazardous chemicals, and situation of water bodies. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to say that in all this, my, the, through the commitment of the government and through our involvement of with many programs that have been thrown out there through the intervention of GN, uh, UNCCD, we have been able to put up a practical uh, solution to the problem. Through this particular year, through the change of government, my government, through his commitment, has vowed to fight illegal mining. And we have currently put a stop to every illegal mining taking place in our country. And one of the things that the president is ensuring, that he's put up a presidential committee who reports directly to him to ensure that certain measures are taken. What we have been observing is that because of unemployment, people still go around Nicodemusly. And then uh, through the, um, uh, the involvement of our chiefs, they are still doing it undercover. But we are determined we've put up a fight by instituting a, a, a security service that will ensure that it is put up for good. We are not just stopping it for stopping sake. One of the things that we are trying to do is to ensure that we know the, the value of deposits of uh, gold. And therefore, prospecting is a crucial thing to address. And then we'll be able to assign properly and give out to people to do responsible mining. 
one of the responsibilities of those who will be assigned to do those small scale mining is to ensure that we are able to restore the land to its value. Currently, our waters are, uh, are, are polluted, and there is a huge uh, need for us to have the right resources to reclaim the land. So it is our wish that we, as a country, we can also sensitize every each and every member of the country to have a mindset change and come along with us to ensure that we are going to put a stop to these bad practices. One of the things that we're also introducing is technology into our way of uh, producing uh, food. And that is, uh, we ensure that the current traditional practices will be a thing of the past. And we are going to make sure that we will adopt responsible agriculture to ensure safety for our land, because that is where we get our livelihood from. So we, what I will finally say for a fact is that in dealing with these issues, we need to create the awareness. I will re-emphasize that. We need to create the awareness and I, I let each and every member of the country be responsible for restoring the land and also ensuring that we are able to use our land wisely. Thank you very much. Very much. Uh, the next speaker is from a very different part of the world, Bhutan. And, uh, country, incidentally, which according to the Carbon Tracker is one of the few countries whose contribution towards addressing climate change exceeds what it should be contributing in terms of its size, etc. So it's a country we should always congratulate for doing far more for climate change than any other country is uh, doing. But uh, this is uh, Mr. Norway, who is the head of the National Environment Commission of, of Bhutan. And may I now invite him to tell us a little. Thank you. What I'm going to do is uh, 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 share a personal uh, experience. And end of the, my statement, I will uh, sh uh, send a message to our soil scientists or land managers who are here with us today. Uh, first, I started my career as a uh, soil scientist. And at that point of time, when we were working on soils, we just focused on increasing crop yield. And that was our motive as we were working on the ground. We carry out lab analysis just to look at soil acidification, soil compaction, soil erosions. But we never connected at that point of time with upstream and downstream relationship. We neither looked at our ecosystem services at that point of time. But with the time, in addition to soil uh, fertility, even for that matter, soil conservation efforts were bit on top down. It is almost from lab to the field. I mean, farmers are forgotten. Your understanding, your local landscapes are forgotten. So that was the scenario. But things have changed by mid-90s or early 90s. And one of the popular uh, approaches that I'll just briefly touch is a landscape approach. Now, there are also ecosystem-based approach. There are so many terminologies by agencies and academics that have come up. So on that uh, uh, landscape approach, I think interestingly, this is something uh, learning through adaptive management. And also there are a lot of multiple uses, multiple purposes. And more importantly, engaging the stakeholders. And on top of that, respecting the tradition and respecting the traditional knowledge. Speaking of the traditional knowledge and traditional practices, if you look within our Asian continent, look those beautiful rice terraces, for example, in Banawe in Philippines, and even if you come to my country, we have a lot of beautiful rice terraces. It's all through traditional knowledge, traditional practices. No uh, science has really come into that. So it is important for us as a scientist to connect with those knowledges 
and blend within your own local context, which is very important for our technology to sustain and move forward. However, all this landscape approach, ecosystem-based approaches, it needs a substantial time for gestation because it will not give you an immediate return. But on the other side, if you look at on our project monitoring or our local leaders, they want to see immediate result. They want to harvest tomorrow. But here is the situation when you really begin to understand the local landscape, begin to uh, consult your local stakeholders, you need that time. Likewise, even for the small holders, small farmers, they cannot spare your land for hedgerows or you know, terraces, for that matter. They wanted to maximize small plot of land so that they can feed their families. So these factors has to be considered when we talk of landscape approach or for that matter, even the sustainable land management in this context. Now, one of the important component we always look forward is the financing, the urgency in financing. Now, for us, for parties to this convention, we have two financial mechanisms, that is Global Environment Facility and Green Climate Fund. Now, I think many of us must have gone through that process. Usually, it takes time. And people say that it's a bit lengthy. It takes time. But on the other side, after formulating a project, if you reflect and think about it, probably in due course, you have, would have learned a lot in both ways, the consultant as well as your local counterparts. So there is a benefit, but you need to look at the time that gets the project you know, formulated. But on the ground side, if you really uh, look at it on our own local side, if this year, if there is a flood, or if uh, your irrigation channel is being washed out, if you do not immediately do so, by next year, that multiplies effects. Or for that matter, if you do not uh, look after the irrigation immediately, renovate it, the community loses its production for a season. So for our farming community, we cannot afford to lose time or afford to lose uh, a season. So this is where we need to really see how we can uh, uh, collaborate and, and work towards it. And briefly, or finally, I want to say that what my own observation, usually speaking, our soil scientists and land managers are a bit poor communicator. We are not really able to, you know, uh, uh, take our message to our uh, leaders, politicians, policy makers. And for these reasons, we are a bit behind, particularly in terms of this desertification, we are a bit behind the biodiversity and climate change. It's not limited to our own soil scientists, but what I'm saying is, it's all to do with our partners and implementing agencies, donors. I think, for example, if, uh, within the uh, project formulation, within the uh, uh, implementing partners, if there is a provision or clause where saying that probably you need to uh, build in climate change, biodiversity, land degradation as a package, I'm sure from each country we can take this forward. And as, as I said yesterday uh, in our, one of our panel discussion, at COP23 in Bonn, there was a, a press release by three executive secretaries of climate change, biodiversity, and land degradation. They are looking for a, a big program where climate change, biodiversity, and land degradation could be encompassed. I thought that was a wonderful uh, uh, initiative, and we as a party to that three conventions must seize this opportunity. This is really an opportunity for us to push our agenda, particularly land component. And in the farming system, particularly countries driven by farming, I would say that probably we should start from the base. The base is our land. 
That's where we must start. And for our land managers and soil scientists, I want to show that our communication skill must be improved massively. With that note, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Nobe, you were talking about the communication skills of soil scientists, but you're a soil scientist and you have communicated excellently and conveyed your message. So I hope other soil scientists will also be like you. May I now turn to uh, Sanjay Suranoyan. She's uh, been in Mongolia for done many different things in Mongolia, but right now she's we're heading the Global Water Partnership. And I suspect she'll want to talk more about water. Yes, Very exactly. Thank okay. you. Thank Michael, you. Great. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Happy New Lunar Year. Actually, I come from Mongolia, and in Bhutan, Mongolia, China, and some other Asian countries, this is the first day of the New Year of the Earth dog. So the dog is supposed to bring loyalty and friendship, so I wish all of us are loyal to the sustainability cause, not only in the year of dog, but throughout in the next years as well. So I think it's a very important topic today, the land degradation, but also uh, desertification, climate change, which countries like my own Mongolia has been also affected. Mongolia warmed up by two point almost two degrees Celsius in the last 50 years or so, which is almost double the global average. And one fourth of our nomadic herders, one fourth of our population are still nomadic herders and they live off the pastures. And traditionally we used to think, okay, actually it's a very um, green, sustainable civilization where you move from one pasture to another, let the pastures rest and you don't accumulate much. But more recently, of course, both climate change which is affecting more desertification and uh, creeping land degradation, but also overgrazing as well has been really causing the, you know, creating havoc in um, our traditional livestock herding. Um, but I think there are ways to go forward and um, some of the ideas that is being talked about today in the next few days will also help us with, to come up with some solutions. Um, as Chair mentioned, I'm chairing Global Water Partnership, which is an intergovernmental organization, but also it's a network of about 3,000 partner organizations in 180 or so countries that are trying to progress water security, integrated water resource management. And those of you who don't come from the water sector uh, may not know, but integrated water resource management, which is, was an idea approved, about, uh, um, came up about 20 years ago, and basically, it's not only about management, good, water, good governance of water, but it's also about governance of land as well. And actually, integrated water resource management, which is actually approved in now over 80% of countries worldwide now have those principles in their water laws, and two-thirds have developed national integrated water resource management plan. But initially, 20 years ago, it was about coordinated development and management of water, land and related resources in order to maximize the result in economic and social welfare in an equitable manner without compromising the sustainability of our vital ecosystems. So, you know, all this um, uh, talk and uh, objective and sustainable development goals about integration of different sectors. So integra integrated good governance of water and good governance of land is very, very important and unfortunately I think within this IWRM, a lot of uh, attention was paid at the country level to water management, but very little lip service in the current theory was put on land issues. And we all know both water and land are the two main pillars of food production. Yesterday, Professor Jeff Jeffrey Sachs, but also Madame Barbut and everybody else is, was talking about, you know, the main challenge in the next coming decades is, of course, uh, the increasing demand for food, and Madame Barbut mentioned maybe the food production demand will go up by 70%. In some of the FAO uh, reports, you can see by 2050, the potential estimated increase in food production may be 60 to 110 percent by 2050. And um, I think somebody called food can be considered as humanity's ultimate security need for the 21st century. And basically, 
Uh, this is primarily because of uncertainties about the availability of sufficient quality farmland and fresh water to support needed increases in the food demand. We all know that in the last 50 years or so, um, the crop production, which more than doubled, it came at a high cost to land and water. The outstanding performance in crop production uh, was actually because we were using more land and taking, extracting more water. I don't think it's any longer possible. Groundwater levels are dwindling. Uh, crop yields are plateauing. And the area of arable land is not only shrinking in many parts of the world, but also quality of soils is also declining. So we need to come up with alternative approaches and with some innovative partnerships and ideas. And, um, uh, and then I think it is about improving governance. You know, you can't, you cannot no longer squeeze, you know, more water or get sort of more land. So one needs to work on governance and people don't really, uh, especially, you know, well, decision makers, we understand, although we don't pay too much attention uh, to that, not, not enough attention to that, but when talk about governance is a bit more boring than just putting irrigation pipes or sanitation pipes as well. But it's very, very important now to improve both the water governance, but also improve the land governance as well. Uh, recently, Global Water Partnership, which I'm chairing, uh, is put a paper on integrated water governance and land governance. Uh, and this is one of the ways also to go forward. Let me just give you one example of this governance um, work that we've been doing and with, together with World Meteorological Organization. World Meteorological Organization and GWP, we launched a few years ago, Integrated Drought Management Program. And it was uh, launched at the high level meeting on national drought policies in 2013. And basically what the program does is concentrates on drought monitoring and early warning systems, vulnerability and impact assessment, drought preparedness, mitigation and response. We came up recently within this program with integrated drought management help desks. So anybody, stakeholders, who will be interested in, you know, how do we prevent droughts? How do we get um, policy and planning for drought man management at the government level? How do we get early warning and mitigation and preparedness? One can actually access the help desk, access about 34 partners of this integrated drought management program, and. Um, ask questions, get expertise, also get, you know, uh, those partner organizations, experts, help you with the knowledge that exists globally as well. So um, and there are ways forward, they're not very easy, and I think we think that the good governance, better water management, and better uh, land management, and coordinated land and water management are very, very important. If the business as usual scenario continues for more food production, we expect that at least 70% more increase in freshwater withdrawal uh, will be needed. And the, we all know that water resources are under severe pressure already. And we all know that water may become one of the main barriers for implementation of sustainable development goals. It's one of the top risks on World Economic Forum's agenda. And at the, we've, we've seen what's been happening in um, Cape Town in the last few weeks and we also some, uh, saw some of the stresses that India has been experiencing with water resources as well. But we need this coordinated, better governance approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm very happy at this connection between land degradation and water issues because that's an important uh, linkage, particularly as we know in India. Our last uh, panelist is uh, Sayed Kayum, who is the but many charges in, uh, in his home country, Fiji. He's a lawyer, he's the attorney general, but he's also the minister for economy. And they have included climate planning as a part of the economy ministry so that it plays a central role. And it's in that context that he has come to speak to us about what they are doing in that area. Would you like to speak from here? Or speak from here. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. They say that uh, there's a saying that he who speaks the last must speak the least. 
which have all the wise people that speak before you. Um, I will just very quickly, I mean, obviously, we've, we've heard from all the other speakers, you know, talk about the reasons for degradation, which obviously from deforestation, from overusage of land, bad farming practices, etc. But of course, climate change also plays a very significant role, not just necessarily in desertification, but from where I come from, that part of the world, and I'm sure there are other coastal countries that do share the experience, is because of encroaching waters, the level, uh, sea level rises. So we find salination of, of soil. Uh, we, for example, where areas the water has not been managed properly, drainage systems have actually failed. Um, for example, one of the second largest islands in Fiji, where people used to plant sugarcane, they no longer can plant, plant sugarcane because of the fact there's too much salt within the actual soil itself. The force has an impact on, as we discussed, on water, accessibility to water, because if you have water access through boreholes, then you actually get salt water. And this obviously is very, very critical. Just to put into perspective, a country like, and I like to speak from the perspective of a, as a Pacific Islander also, that the countries like Kiribati, which is only 12 feet above sea level, they have already bought about 5,500 acres of land in Fiji for food security. Now, there are enormous implications for that. Um, you have climate, climate refugees. Uh, where will they go if, you know, 33 islands they have, if about f uh, you know, half of them go underwater, where will they go? Already, they cannot, for example, even plant root crops, etc., in certain parts of the, of the islands that they live in. So these are some of the hardcore realities. In Fiji ourselves, we've moved three villages to higher ground, or relocated them, I should say. There's another 42 because of inundation of, of, sea, la of sea waters. Now, there is a whole impact on the sustainability of their livelihoods, and the topic, of course, we're talking about combating land degradation for enhanced livelihoods, sustainable and resilient societies. So what can we do? I think all of the speakers probably have hinted. The assistant minister obviously talked at length, in fact, about the, the real tension between the financial benefits of exploiting your, your soil, exploiting your forests for a financial gain now, as opposed to not receiving any financial gain in the future. So I think that is the real tension. So how do we actually address that? How do we actually stop people from deforesting? How do we actually stop people from overusage of land? How do we stop people from actually using chemicals when in the end they kill, you completely kill the soil, the health of the soil? That, ladies and gentlemen, we believe is the real tension as far as you know, combating that particular issue is concerned. So what incentives, what initiatives can we provide? Of course, we have initiatives such as the uh, Red Plus. Um, we believe that it has not necessarily worked well because there's not enough incentives, there's not enough private sector understanding or indeed buy-in of the Red Plus program. We have, of course, as the uh, Under Secretary General talked about this particular fund, I always forget the name of this fund, which is the Land Degradation Neutrality Fund. And uh, as it was highlighted, that sometimes accessibility to these funds are somewhat you know, drawn out perhaps too bureaucratic, but there's a real need to be able to mainstream accessibility to these funds if we are to be actually get a buy-in of the ordinary citizen in your country. Uh, we have seen, for example, wherever there is forest reserves, sometimes you do actually get people cutting down trees because of the fact there is a financial need. So how do we actually engage with them to ensure that does not happen? We have on the flip side, of course, because of the fact that we have challenges to climate change. A country like Fiji only contributes about 0.04 towards the total global output of carbon. Very little, but we are on the coal face of climate change. Uh, so we have, for example, formed a new Ministry of Waterways where we are looking specifically at things like, you know, hydrological forecasting, looking at uh, irrigation systems, how do we uh, manage our riverbanks, our water systems, to be able to ensure there's no further degradation and to be able to ensure that in the long term there is actual sustainability for these people who actually get affected uh, by uh, such, a, such, such a phenomena. So ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to sort of highlight those key issues to you. Um, I understand we're running short of time because the other people took up our time. So I don't want to eat up the next person's time. Uh, so with those few words, I'd like to conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, we are short of time. Our next panelists and uh, groups are already uh, here. Uh, 
So I'm not sure, we, uh, I do suspect we don't really have time for a lot of questions. But what I found is that the panelists have covered way wide ground and uh, can you know, tell us. So for me, the takeaways from this are uh, two or three or four major takeaways. One is that you cannot separate issues of land management, land conservation, for that matter, any resource conservation in livelihoods. You cannot conserve a resource by denying somebody a livelihood. You cannot assure a livelihood for somebody unless you conserve the resource. And unless we understand that the two things have to be done together, we won't go far. Second, one clear message is that the sources of pressure on land are not just what we have traditionally uh, thought of, particularly in India, as uh, agrarian. That we, when we looked at it, basically as a problem which arises because of agrarian uh, practices, but uh, uh, solutions which have to be found to protect agrarian uh, livelihoods. And increasingly, people are realizing that the pressures on land come from many different sources, including illegal mining, it was mentioned, including the impact of climate change, particularly for the examples mentioned about sea, the intrusion of uh, seawater and the pressures that that uh, is uh, going to pose. And I think when we look at conservation, we'll have to take this broader perspective in mind and not just look at it uh, uh, in uh, isolation. The third thing that I take away from this is the importance of connecting. Connect land with water. Connect land and water with biodiversity. Uh, and biodiversity, one of my favorite examples is we have reached a situation in Punjab today where the farmers have to get hill apiaries to bring their beehives down into the fields because all the tree cover locally has been lost and there are no trees for the bees and the birds to home in. Now this is ridiculous and in that sense this is a very interesting example of how agriculture and biodiversity are connected. It's not simply a matter of giving up agriculture to protect biodiversity but protecting biodiversity to help agriculture. So I think it's very important to start connecting these dots. The words used for this are like landscape planning, ecological approach, etc. It doesn't matter what the words are used. The barriers to this one is that conservation requires a long-term perspective. Uh, if you take, for instance, salinity, you have to ask a farmer to take the land away from cultivation for maybe three, four, five years. What does a farmer do in that meantime? So finding solutions for the short-term problems that would arise because of these measures is, I think, important. Uh, the second thing is multiple ownership, which arises. I may have, my land may be the one which is required for, build, for creating a forest to protect, the, to provide the services, ecosystem services required for that region. But his land may be the one next to that which will benefit from that. So it will be his. And now this is the problem which arises. And why should I be made to give up? the use of my land in order to benefit others. This is where things like land adjustment come in, what we do in urban areas, which is the three of us have to be brought together, surrender whatever amount of land is required for that purpose collectively, and share the rest in the same proportion again, which is what we do in certain urban areas. We did that in a few places in India. So there are concepts like this that we will have to think of in order to actually implement uh, the, these possibilities. And then there's, of course, the big challenge of climate change. The fact is, historically, we as societies have depended on the sustainable uh, use of land, water, and biodiversity. And we've lost that capacity to look at these in that context of integration of sustainability. And what the message I get, which is common to all of them, is that unless we start doing that, we're going to get ourselves into very serious trouble with the sort of numbers or that we are looking ahead for the next few decades. I'm sorry that I have to deny you the, the, the possibility of raising questions with the uh, panelists, but the panelists will be around and you can buttonhole them when they go out. But our next panelists are ready, so thank you very much. And once again, my apologies to you for not being able to pose the panel and to the panelists from uh, also. Thank you very much.